Ladies and gentlemen, please rise as Southern Exposure, the West Memphis High School Vocal Arts Choir, sings our national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome University of Arkansas Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Sharon Gaber. Good evening. Welcome to the Silas Hunt Legacy Award Celebration. I'm delighted all of you could join us for this wonderful occasion. We have a tremendous evening planned for you, beginning with dinner momentarily. Before we get to that, though, I'd like to recognize the generous sponsors of tonight's event. Arvest Bank, Inclusion Magazine, TES Productions, University of Arkansas Athletics and the Razorback Foundation, University of Arkansas Alumni Association and Black Alumni Society. Won't you all join me in giving our sponsors a round of applause. Thanks to all of you for supporting this worthwhile event. Tonight, we honor four individuals who have shown through a lifetime of work to be richly deserving of our recognition. The award is named, of course, for Silas Hunt, whose intelligence, courage, and perseverance has set a powerful example for individuals of all backgrounds. Let me be the first to thank each of you for being here. I'd also like to recognize just a few guests by name. With us tonight are UA System President Don Bobbitt and his wife Susan. Members of the University of Arkansas Board of Trustees, including Jane Rogers, along with her husband Jay, Dr. Carl Johnson, and his wife Patricia. And we have a number of former Silas Hunt Legacy Award recipients with us. As I say your name, could you please stand and be recognized? Mr. Gerald Alley, Dr. Margaret Clark, Dr. Bobby Jones and his wife, Corinne, Ms. Janice Kearney and her husband, Bob Nash, Dr. Lonnie Williams and his wife, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, we're delighted you could join us tonight to welcome new members to your ranks. Having you all with us makes tonight even more special. I'd also like to thank Southern Exposure from West Memphis High School for that wonderful re rendition of our national anthem. We'll get to hear more from them later on in the evening. Thank you also to the Lee High School Concert Choir from Mariana, who will also perform for us later this evening. And thank you to Rodney Block and the Real Music Lovers who performed during the reception and will continue to entertain us during dinner and after the program. Final, finally, I'd like to thank the Silas Hunt Legacy Awards Selection Committee and the Planning Committee for putting this whole night together. I know none of this would be possible without all of your hard work. 
Since its inception in 2006, the Silas Hunt Legacy Award has been given to 14 individuals. Tonight, we will add four more names to this esteemed group. We honor them because they have honored us. Through their accomplishments, determination, integrity, and service to others, they have distinguished themselves as outstanding members of the University of Arkansas family. And they prove that the spirit of Silas Hunt lives on. My warmest congratulations to this year's recipients. And to everyone, thanks so much again for coming. We'll begin tonight's festivities with a wonderful dinner. Please enjoy catching up with old friends or getting to know new ones. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present the Lee High School Concert Choir from Mariana, Arkansas. The Lee High School Concert Choir was started by educator Dave D'Angelo three years ago. Beginning with familiar tunes, certain choral elements and music literacy were introduced. While laying that foundation, the choir began progressing into standard choral repertoire and competing at several festivals and events, including the Arkansas Choral Performance Association and Ole Miss's annual Fall Choral Festival. The concert choir is under the direction of Catherine West. Please welcome the Lee High School Concert Choir. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the screens for a message from Arkansas Governor Mike Beebe. Good evening. Arkansas has made great strides in education during the past decade. In fact, our state public education system now ranks fifth in America. This achievement is one that we all can be proud of, but one that must not satisfy us. Many tasks remain in our quest for statewide excellence in education. Among the most important is making sure that students of all backgrounds have access to higher education. Silas Hunt's admission to the University of Arkansas School of Law made him the first black student in modern times to attend a major southern public university, but it made him much more than that. His legacy serves as a reminder of the promise and possibility that exists in all our people, including those in underrepresented or underprivileged groups. 
It is our responsibility as parents, educators, and mentors to help our young people reach their full potential. Because of tonight's trailblazing honorees, the path to the quality of life that higher education affords has been made easier for all of today's students. Tonight, as we recognize our 2012 Silas Hunt honorees, don't just applaud them, applaud the opportunities they have helped bring to our children. Arkansas's continued advances in education will help us continue the progress we need throughout our lives to make this a better state and a better country. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome University of Arkansas Vice Provost for Diversity Affairs, Charles Robinson. Good evening. Tonight we have gathered to recognize four outstanding individuals who have made contributions to promoting diversity at the University of Arkansas. Before we acknowledge them, it is important that we take a few moments to reflect upon the history and meaning associated with this occasion. During the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, one of the songs that became popular for activists was a melody entitled, This Little Light of Mine. It was a fairly simple song, yet upbeat, with a highly flexible chorus that could be added to verses that fit the occasion for which the activists were gathering. If they were in church, they might use traditional versions of the song and sing, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, or Jesus gave it to me. I'm going to let it shine or hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. But when they were engaged in their protests, sometimes they would change the words. If they were locked down in a dark and dreary cell in order to find courage, someone would sing, even in this jail, I'm going to let it shine. When they were facing crowds of angry mobs and police with vicious dogs, someone might shout out, won't let Jim Crow blow it out. <laughs> I'm going to let it shine. Although the verses change to meet the circumstances, one thing always remained the same. The light had to keep shining. Regardless of the frustration of the moment or the difficulty of the hour, Nothing could be allowed to turn off the light. Why? Because the light was an enabler. It made it possible for people to see their destination clearly and to move deliberately from where they were to where they wanted to be. The light represented meaningful unity. As they sang and rallied together, the activists understood that their individual lights were in fact part of a tapestry of lights that affected outcomes for generations past, present, and future. And the light had transformative power. Nothing could be allowed to turn off the light because for these activists, it was the light that had caused the Red Sea to part. It was the light that had caused the walls of Jericho to tumble. And it would be this same light that would make equal opportunity a living, breathing reality right here in the United States of America. <laughs> Silas Hunt embraced this ethos. He worked in step with this idea. In 1948, when Silas Hunt insisted on being allowed to act upon his axiomatic right to attend the University of Arkansas, he did so at a time when the shadow of segregation covered the state and much of the nation. You know, the University of Arkansas, like many Southern institutions at the time, suffered from a racial myopia that made it non-receptive to people like Hunt, who wanted nothing more than the opportunity to gain access to an empowering education that would enhance their chances of achieving the American dream. When Silas Hunt arrived on campus, he was not welcomed. 
There were no orientations arranged to assist in his acclamation. There were no receptions or meetings called to recognize the significance of the historical moment. He was never asked to join with others to call the hogs. <laughs> Set adrift in a vast sea of social isolation, indifference, and bitter anonymity, Silas Hunt was left to himself to find his own way and to facilitate his own destiny alone. Yet, through it all, he stayed true to his mission. Through it all, Silas Hunt let his light shine. And this amazing light, though seemingly small in the context of world events transpiring at the time, would prove prodigious and have a profound impact upon the historical direction of our university. This amazing light would work to transform the various policies of our institution from the dark and dreary tenets of segregation and exclusion to the bright and brilliant standard of diversity and inclusion. This amazing light would begin the process, would begin the process of moving our institution from the low and shallow plane of supplying education to a few to that high and uplifted mountain of providing knowledge and illumination to the masses. This amazing light would serve as a beacon to the tens of thousands who would follow, delivering the good news that their dreams for personal betterment could be well achieved within our pristine and hallowed halls. Tonight, we are here to remember Silas Hunt and to recognize those who have contributed to the effort of making our university a more welcoming and inclusive one. We have gathered to acknowledge people who through their work and sacrifices have pushed us further along the sacred continuum of human progress and enlightenment. However, as we celebrate tonight, it is important for us to consider that the effort that Silas Hunt began more than 64 years ago is still a work in progress. The movement. The movement that he started is still one that is incomplete. Although we have made significant strides, there continues to be much more that we must do if we are to ensure that the educational playing field is level enough to allow all students real access to our empowering resources of knowledge. And we can never be satisfied with simply doing better. Incremental progress may appease us, but it does not remedy the pains of dreams deferred, nor does it remove the heavy burden of potential unrealized. As a flagship institution, we have a moral obligation to work hard to rescue the children of our state wherever they may be, whoever they may be, though the heavens fall. Now is the time for each of us to enlist in this service. Now is the time for each of us to commit to this cause. If we labor together, if we let our lights shine together with unrelenting purpose and resolve, then we will be able to speed up that day when the glow of our unity will spread and fill the land. And when this happens, when our institution flexes the full extent of its educational muscle, then the University of Arkansas, our beloved alma mater, will become that lighthouse of hope signaling the historic message of opportunity to people from the four corners of this great state. Send me your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Chancellor of the University of Arkansas, G. David Gerhardt.
Wow, Charles. I want to thank my staff for having me speak after Charles. We will have a meeting early Monday morning about that. That was terrific. I want to take uh, just a moment to talk about three people that are here with us tonight and introduce them to you. You've met them. Many of you have met them before or maybe just tonight. We are so pleased and so proud to be able to attract one of the best business deans in the nation, somebody who is well respected throughout America, somebody who is the head of a business school, a major business school at LSU. And I can't tell you how delighted we are that they are here this evening, Eli and Fern Jones. And I want to tell you that we got two for one, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to ask Eli and Fern if you would please stand and be welcome. The new dean of the Walton College of Business. And I also want to take this opportunity to recognize another person. You know, we've had a tough week at the University of Arkansas. You've all read about it. You've all seen the blogs and everything that's been happening at our institution this past week. And I have to tell you that we are very, very proud that the University of Arkansas stood tall and did the right thing. And I just want to take this opportunity to introduce the person who really has defined integrity for the University of Arkansas, and that's our Vice Chancellor and Director of Athletics, Jeff Long. Jeff? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know, as good as Jeff is, Dr. Bobbitt and I have decided that he would not make a good system president or chancellor. <laughs> Those jobs are already filled, Jeff, so. Well, thank you. It is a pleasure to be here tonight. I'd like to congratulate the Silas Hunt Legacy Award Selection Committee for their work in identifying four candidates for this well-deserved honor. Thanks also to the Planning Committee for putting together this wonderful evening. And thank you, Charles, for those thoughtful and timely remarks. You've truly expressed what this night is really about. In his position as Vice Provost for Diversity Affairs, Charles has served this university and the larger Arkansas community tremendously well. He is the driving force behind our school's continued progress on the diversity front. And really, anyone who has met Charles knows that he is a force, period. Thank you, Charles. I'm proud to work with somebody who is so dedicated to excellence and who is so passionate about these important issues. Let me now offer my warmest congratulations to tonight's four Legacy Award honorees. Dr. Roderick McDavis, Dr. Christopher C. Mercer, Coach Nolan Richardson, and Professor Marjorie Wilkins-Williams. You have all been selected because of your character, your personal accomplishments, and your contributions to the university. What so impresses me is that you have all made your marks in such different arenas, in education, law, health and wellness, and athletics. As members of the Razorback family, you have continued in the pioneer spirit set forth by Silent Hunt. And truly, you are pioneers. As we'll soon hear, the four of you have achieved numerous firsts at the University of Arkansas. Now, being the first to do something is never easy, as we all know. But you have helped carve new paths for future generations.
For that, we are all ever grateful. Tonight, we honor you for a lifetime of important work. But let us make no mistake, for the University of Arkansas, there is still much more work to be done. We all must continue to work to ensure equal access to higher education for everyone. The Silas Hunt Award, this legacy, affirms the importance of equal opportunity, the need to open doors and tear down barriers to student achievement. The promise of a high quality education at this our state's flagship university must extend to everyone, particularly those who come from underrepresented or underprivileged groups. No matter their background, their race, their economic standing, all of our young people deserve the opportunity to better themselves and broaden their world through higher education. As Chancellor, I know that diversity and access are crucial to the success and vitality of our university. With this in mind, let me just tell you for a few moments some of the important developments and campus initiatives that we have going at the flagship. I'll start by taking a look at the changing face of our student body, because when it comes to progress, the proof is, as they say, in the numbers. This past year saw a 10.5% increase in African American enrollment, and black students represent the largest minority group on campus. <laughs> Latino enrollment has increased an impressive 24% over the previous year, and now Latinos represent 4.6% of the total student population. Historically, African Americans and Latinos have been underrepresented among our student demographics. We are closing the gap. And I am proud to say to you that today's U of A is the most diverse student body in the history of the institution. Now friends, these numbers didn't happen by accident. I've already mentioned Dr. Charles Robinson's incredible work with the Office of Diversity Affairs. But another person who has been crucial to our recent gains is Dr. Luis Fernando Restrepo. In 2010, Luis was appointed Assistant Vice Provost for Diversity Affairs, and since then has made remarkable strides for our institution, particularly with the burgeoning Latino community in Northwest Arkansas. Last fall, he became the head of the newly created Office of Latino academic advancement and community relations. Luis has tapped into the large and vibrant Latino community in Northwest Arkansas in places like Rogers and Bentonville. His multifaceted community-based approach to Latino recruitment and retention has quickly paid huge dividends. Luis, I'd like to ask you to stand so that you might be recognized. Thank you. I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize the entire Diversity Affairs team for their exceptional work. Would I uh, get all of you to please stand, if you would, so that we can thank you for your contribution to the cause. Members of the Diversity Affairs staff, please. Thank you. Now, moving away briefly from our corner of the state, I'd like to go to the far eastern part of Arkansas to talk about another exciting initiative. Last fall, the University of Arkansas unveiled its new Delta Schools College Completion Consortium. Now that name's a mouthful, but the goal is very simple. We want more young people from eastern Arkansas to go to college, and we want to make the University of Arkansas as attractive a choice for them as possible. Participating schools include West Memphis High School, and the KIPP Delta Collegiate High School in Helena, West Helena. They have agreed to work with us to offer students guidance and support in the college application and selection process. Leslie Yingling, Charles Robinson, and other members of the Office of Diversity Affairs have visited high schools all across the Delta region. Leslie serves as the district liaison, providing support for assemblies and workshops to help students with the application and financial aid process. The university also provides access to summer bridge. We call them summer bridge 
programs designed to acclimate students to university life in Northwest Arkansas. As we all know, race, race and ethnicity are only part of what goes into creating a diverse campus. We are also committed to geographic and socioeconomic diversity. The Delta Schools College Completion Consortium demonstrates this commitment to serving all parts of our state and students of all demographics. Of course, simply increasing the number of underrepresented students is not enough. We want to ensure that our student body is not only diverse, but high achieving. And we don't simply want them to enroll here. We want them to thrive for the duration of their academic careers. The Razorback Bridge Program, now in its third year, has helped our university recruit the highest caliber of students from diverse backgrounds, while also giving them the ongoing tools and support that they need to succeed. Each year, a select group of highly qualified Arkansas students from underrepresented populations receives 3,500 annual renewable scholarships. In addition, these bridge scholars receive peer and faculty mentoring, introductions to academic resources, and professional development opportunities, all aimed at ensuring these students have long-term success. It is a program that we are all tremendously proud of. There is much more that I would love to talk about, but in terms of university diversity, I could go on all night, but I have limited time. Let me add that minority faculty recruitment and retention remain a key goal and something that we're working very hard to address. The number of Asian, African American, and Hispanic faculty have all increased each of the last three years but we are determined to do a better job in the years ahead. Every college, every department at our university has made diversity a core priority. Our deans have worked very hard. Just this February, the School of Law received a $300,000 grant from the Law School Admission Council to promote increased minority enrollment. I can go on, but I would like to close by moving from what is happening right now in terms of diversity affairs to what I hope will happen in the near future. As Chancellor, I commit to you that I will continue to advocate on the state and national level for passage of the DREAM Act. This legislation, <laughs> this legislation would provide children of undocumented immigrants, many of whom are Latinos, already deeply enmeshed in American society, a path to legal residency by either going to college or enlisting in the military. Now folks, as an educator, I know how hard our faculty and staff work to bring in as many bright, accomplished students to our campus as possible. And so it makes little sense to me that we are turning our backs on so many great, qualified, outstanding students whom we would otherwise welcome with open arms if it weren't for our immigration laws. To bring attention, to bring attention to this pressing issue, we will be hosting a panel discussion on April 23 called Undocumented, Living in the Shadows. This panel will provide a nationally relevant discussion of the perspectives, experiences of undocumented immigrants who have spent much, if not most, of their lives living in the United States. Undocumented, living in the shadows will be held at the Fayetteville Town Center. So if you're in Fayetteville, if you have that day free, I hope you will consider attending this timely and much needed discussion. Silas Hunt taught us that opportunity is precious. When everyone is afforded the opportunity to succeed and thrive, we all benefit as a school, as a state, as a nation. Promoting diversity isn't just doing what's right for others. It's about doing what's best for all of us. This evening, ladies and gentlemen, is a tribute to what happens when we give deserving men and women opportunities and what happens when they run with them. It's my hope that the work we are doing today to promote a more equitable, diverse, and accessible university will bear similar fruit. 
one day. Thank you for coming. It's been a pleasure to be with you this evening. And again, congratulations, heartiest congratulations to all of tonight's honorees. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the screens as we introduce the first of four Silas Hunt Legacy Award recipients. I grew up in, in Little Rock, Arkansas. In fact, I was born in a little town called Keele, Arkansas. And uh, my parents had 13 children. I had always wanted to be a professional nurse. And there was no other place in the state of Arkansas where I can become an RN, no other place. Uh, the nearest place was at uh, Homer G. Phillips in St. Louis. And of course, coming from a large family, there was no way I could afford to go to St. Louis to become a nurse. And so I had no choice. And when they opened up the School of Nursing, I was just delighted to have the opportunity. I had an uncle who told me that I had no business going there and tried to talk me out of going. He says, you just are in danger going there. You're going to get hurt. None of that really happened. We had no one threw anything at us, or, you know, we heard a few little comments, but no one was really that evil or hurtful toward us. Oh, my parents deserve a medal for allowing me to go. They really did not feel comfortable with me going there. There were three of us who integrated the university in 1955. There was Billy Rose, Whitfield, Jacobs. A Maxine Sutton Cannon and then myself. I faced some harsh realities. I really thought that everybody would love me. <laughs> there was no reason for them not to like me. I was a likable person. I liked everybody and I'd always grown up in a community where I was accepted and, and uh, this was quite a different uh, society for me. It was it requires some adjustment to be able to go to the university like that. We were denied a lot of things really by law. For example, the three of us, the three undergraduate students, and we all lived together, we all knew each other, we had decided one day that we would go out and join the band because we all played band instruments. You know, we were naive enough to think that we could go there and join the Marching 100. <laughs> so when we go to the band house, we were allowed to audition and we were assigned a seat and all, and we practiced with the band. But then we were just told flat out, you can perform on campus, but you cannot perform outside of the campus. And after a while, we decided it wasn't worth our time, so we didn't go back. There were fun memories. Uh, we had a couple of teachers there who really did sort of take us under their wings and, and would help us. They would tutor us. We had a number of students who were really warm and accepting, and uh, we had very little overt discrimination. Mostly we were just ignored more than anything else. The one good thing that came out of the university is I found my husband there. My husband, who was from North Little Rock, right across the river from where I lived, and he was a graduate student there. And I was a little undergraduate, and they welcomed us. There were about two or three uh, black graduate students who were on the campus at that time. And they really sort of helped us along. One of them had a car, and, take us to the grocery store and would take us around a little bit. So that's how I met my husband on the campus. I didn't see myself as a pioneer at the time. When I first went there, my goal was really to get in, to get my degree, and to get out with my body and my mind intact. <laughs> And with God's help, I was able to do just that, but it was not easy. I had some difficult times. It means everything to me because it, it made my life a lot easier. I got everything that I needed, everything that I wanted. I wanted to be a professional nurse. 
that was the one way of doing that, and I was able to accomplish that. And I was able to really move up in my field from just a regular hospital nurse, and I worked in the operating room, and then I finally got into teaching, and so I was able to move on up the ladder in education. So it meant a lot to me. I think I was very well prepared. And I, I think in a way we did make it easier for them because the very first semester there were three of us. The next semester there were several more that came and, and after that. So I think that made it easier for other students to come. They knew they weren't going to be um, hurt or injured or threatened in any way like that. I was really delighted uh, when I heard that I would receive uh, this award. It really is a wonderful group to be a part of. Yes, I'm just really thrilled to have been named, uh, to have been given this honor to me. I would cherish, I would cherish this honor. Good evening. It is a privilege to be here tonight introducing our first Silas Hunt Legacy Award winner. All of tonight's honorees have one thing in common. They were all pioneers. The first to integrate the School of Law, the first African-American basketball coach, the first African-American dean of the College of Education and Health Professions at the University of Arkansas, and tonight's first honoree, Marjorie Williams, was also a pioneer among the first three African-American nursing students to enroll in the university in 1955. It takes a special kind of character to be a pioneer. You have to be willing to face the unknown and risk failure. Indeed, you have to understand that there are people who don't even know you who are hoping that you will fail. You have to accept that you will not be judged as an individual, but as a group. And you have to be willing to take on that additional and unfair responsibility. Marjorie was willing to do that and much more. She was willing to suffer the everyday indignities imposed on her by an institution that really didn't care if she was successful or not. She and her pioneering classmates, whose name also bear mentioning, Billy Rose Whitfield Jacobs and Maxine Sutton Cannon, were not permitted to use facilities of the neighboring dorm, not even to eat, or wash their clothes. While in the company of her fiance, Marjorie once was asked to leave the student section at a football game. She was housed in separate facilities from the other students on hospital and clinic visits and stayed on the bus when her peers went to eat at restaurants rather than suffer the indignity and embarrassment of being refused service. What kind of character does it take to endure that? A very, very strong character one that is committed to her course of action and driven to succeed. Persevering, Marjorie graduated in 1959 and then went on to earn a master's degree in guidance and counseling from Troy State University. And then a master of science degree in nursing from the University of Texas Health Science Center. She spent 30 years as a professor of nursing at San Antonio College and served on the School of Nursing faculty at Troy State University and worked as a general staff and operating room nurse in addition to her higher academics. She used her difficult and alienating experiences as a pioneer to become the person that she is today. For her contributions to this university and to higher education in general, as well as her long-standing career as a health professional, Marjorie Williams is an outstanding candidate to receive the Silas Hunt Legacy Award. Marjorie, please accept my congratulations on behalf of the University of Arkansas. of the Board of Trustees, President Bobbitt, faculty, staff, and students, we present the, the Silas Hunt Legacy Award.
to Professor Marjorie Wilkins Williams in recognition of the distinction you have brought to the University of Arkansas and your significant impact on the state of Arkansas, the nation, and the world. Congratulations. Good evening, and thank all of you for joining me this evening. When I first enrolled in the School of Nursing, I had no thoughts about being a pioneer or a legacy or anything else. I just wanted to be a professional nurse. And so when the university afforded me the opportunity, I didn't hesitate. But I know it was God's grace and mercy that got me through. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> There were times when I struggled, but fortunately for me, I didn't have to struggle by myself because there were two other African-American students who enrolled in the program with me. And it's been mentioned, they were Billy Rose, Whitfield Jacobs, and Maxine Sutton Cannon. The three of us encouraged each other, we protected each other, and we persevered. And I realized that most of my, oftentimes we've talked about some of the problems and difficulties that I experienced as a student. But I have to say, it wasn't all bad. We had some good moments. And through the years, I met wonderful people who were helpful and encouraging. The bottom line, the end result, is that the university prepared me well for my chosen career. And because of that, I was able to do what I love and to do it well. And I think I was able to make a difference in the lives of many people. And so thank you very much for sharing this uh, very exciting evening with me. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the screens as we introduce this evening's second Silas Hunt Legacy Award recipient. I was uh, born and raised in Dayton, Ohio. Um, all of my um, early childhood memories are in Dayton, and lived in Dayton really through uh, high school. Uh, went to elementary um, uh, school as well as high school in uh, the city of Dayton. So all of my um, uh, childhood and, and teenage years were spent primarily in the black community. However, I went to an integrated high school. And I think what it did for me was to help me understand that uh, our society was kind of a dual society. And my parents always taught us that we would have to learn how to live in both uh, the black community and the white community and fundamentally an integrated community. The high school that I had attended, all male high school, um, uh, really prepared me academically uh, to fit in to a high university, which then was a very um, uh, white university, but was beginning in 1966 to recruit a number of black students. And so I was part of that effort to integrate uh, and diversify uh, Ohio University. Uh, I was the first African-American faculty member hired at the University of Florida in that particular department. And, and so there was much to do over that. Uh, I knew that, you know, uh, coming to the University of Arkansas, I was the first African-American dean hired here. We found the University of Arkansas a very welcoming community uh, from the standpoint of integrating us into the community. My wife taught English uh, in Kemple Hall uh, in the Department of English, and I was a dean of the uh, College of uh, Education uh, uh, at, at, at that particular time. And so uh, we both uh, felt very comfortable uh, being part of the University of Arkansas community. So we had 
are challenges more or less at the social cultural level in Fayetteville from the standpoint of having to go to Little Rock to get a haircut, having to go to Little Rock to at times go to an African American church. So those were some of the challenges at the personal level, but in terms of uh, kind of acceptance, uh, we felt very much accepted uh, by the people that, that we were around. Anytime you're first, there are a series of, of challenges that are difficult to, to overcome. You know, people look at you in a certain way, people treat you in a certain way that you're not accustomed to, and, and many of those challenges that exist in 2012 were here in 1948, I'm sure. So for Silas Hunt, uh, I can well imagine some of the challenges that he faced uh, as he tried to get out and about in Fayetteville. Uh, I think my presence uh, on this campus uh, kind of opened some doors for, I hope it did, for some uh, students who took a second look at the University of Arkansas and said maybe that would be a good place for me to come to school. So uh, my hope was that, that part of my responsibility in, 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 in my work here was being able to convince other African Americans that come into the University of Arkansas was a good thing. And I certainly commend the University of Arkansas for uh, establishing uh, this award because I think over time it will help to focus on a very, very important part of the campus, uh, which is uh, how do we help our campus to become more diverse? Well, certainly one way we do that is by lifting up people that we want to honor. And in honoring those people, we're sending a message uh, to uh, those in our state as well as around the country that we value diversity, that we think that people who come from diverse backgrounds have contributed to our uh, nation, have contributed to this state, have contributed to this campus. So, so I think this award uh, goes a long way uh, toward helping to uh, make the point that the University of Arkansas cares about diversity. You know, when you start this kind of an award series, you know, you start uh, primarily with people that you know an awful lot about, people that have worked at the university, people that have contributed in Arkansas, but ultimately, you know, it will extend probably beyond uh, the university and beyond uh, Arkansas uh, to people across the country. And again, when you lift up diversity and you make it uh, such that uh, there's, a, there's a recognition for it, there's an award for it, all of a sudden people start to pay attention to what you're all about. It shows a commitment. It shows that you, you, you care, it shows your concern, uh, but most importantly, it shows that you're willing to recognize uh, people for uh, their life's work. I'm humbled and, and honored to be part of such a distinguished group of honorees. Uh, you know, I hope that in you know, my time at the University of Arkansas, I was able to contribute something to advance this institution uh, to more national prominence. And I think uh, the other three honorees have just done an outstanding job in their lives and certainly in their careers of, uh, of excellence. And so, uh, as I say, I'm honored and, and humbled to be part of such a distinguished class of, uh, of honorees. It gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's next recipient of the Silas Hunt Legacy Award, Dr. Rod McDavis. Now I know some of you are probably wondering, why is Don Peterson introducing Rod McDavis? I'll tell you why. I was fortunate to be in the position to hire him as a dean back in 1989. When Rod applied for the Dean of Education and Health Professions here, I was Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. At that time, it was clear to me that the University of Florida was not utilizing his administrative talents to the fullest extent possible. I knew immediately Rod was going to do big things, one of which was to be the first American, African-American dean of our College of Education and Health Professions, if we were lucky. Being the first meant additional scrutiny and possibly being held to unrealistic and unfair standards, but Rod handled it superbly. It didn't take long for him to confirm my view and convince me that he would someday be a university president. We kept him for five years before Florida saw the light and recruited him back as their dean of education. <laughs> Later in 1999, when Virginia Commonwealth was considering him for vice president for academic affairs, I told them that not only would he make a great chief academic officer, but that he had all the right qualities to be a university president someday. While I absolutely believed that, I had no reservation about the University of Florida losing him for a second time. <laughs> it 
Well, it didn't take long for Ohio University to recognize his abilities, and they made him just the second alumnus to be named president in 2004. Though the success was all his own, there's something deeply gratifying about recognizing the talents and abilities of someone early on like Rod, and then watching others figure it out over the years. As president of Ohio University, I've heard him variously described as chief cheerleader, an eloquent preacher, and a rock star, not only on campus, but in Malaysia. That's kind of an inside joke. I've kept up with his presidency over the years by reading and know how he handles some very tough issues. Not only that, but he has a knack for, for making a meaningful gesture. Dr. McDavis got his undergraduate degree in 1970, a particularly turbulent time in this country. It was the height of the protests over the war in Vietnam, and nowhere were those protests more dramatic than in Ohio where the Kent State Massacre occurred on May 4, 1970. This was a day, just days before he was scheduled to graduate. The graduation ceremonies at Ohio were canceled, and he and his classmates did not get the opportunity to walk across the stage when they graduated. Forty years later, Rod saw to it that some 140 of the graduates of 1970 got to join the graduation ceremony for the class of 2010. Whenever I think my estimation of Rod McDavis cannot go any higher, he reveals greater depths of empathy, insight, and understanding. For his contributions to this university and higher education in general, Dr. McDavis is an exemplary candidate to receive the Silas Hunt Legacy Award. It gives me great, great pleasure to see integrity, high character, and hard work confirmed with this honor. You deserve this recognition, Rod. Congratulations. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, President Bobbitt, faculty, staff, and students, we present the Silas Hunt Legacy Award to President Roderick J. McDavis in recognition of the distinction you have brought to the University of Arkansas and your significant impact on the state of Arkansas, the nation, and the world. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. We are all standing on the shoulders of those who came before us. And so it is with that deep understanding and appreciation of those who came before me that I thank uh, the University of Arkansas for this honor to be a recipient of the Silas Hunt Legacy Award speaks volumes for the University of Arkansas because it was Silas Hunt who made it possible for me uh, to come to the University of Arkansas. So I thank the University of Arkansas. I also thank those who served with me in my tenure as Dean of the College of Education and Health Professions those faculty and staff who worked with me helped us to lift that college to a higher level of excellence. But more importantly, it helped us to open doors for students who might not otherwise have an opportunity to get a college education. And that is what those of us in higher education are charged with, a responsibility to do something for others, responsibility to give something precious. And there is nothing in this world more precious than an education. So I, I come to you this evening 
with a heart of thanks. I come thanking Don Peterson for that very gracious and generous introduction. I thank him for seeing in a young person who stood before him, who sat before him, the potential that I possessed to be a dean at this great university. Because without that step, I would not be standing before you this evening as president of my alma mater. I also thank Dan Farrader, who was chancellor of the University of Arkansas at that time, who also said, yes, let's give this young man an opportunity to serve as dean. I also thank this great state. Arkansas is a very special state to me. You see, my father was born in Marvel, Arkansas. And I have an awful lot of family who are in Little Rock, Arkansas. So for me, coming to Arkansas was coming home. It was coming back to a place that my father had been that I didn't know. But I came to know, and until my dying day, Arkansas will hold a special place in my heart. For it gave me the opportunity to demonstrate the talent and skill that God gave me, and I thank him every day. You see, a lot of people say they have faith, but a lot of people don't express that faith. And I've come here tonight to express to you my faith in a living God who saw in me promise who saw in me a young man that was willing to give of himself. For it is written that the greatest thing that we can do in this life is to give something to somebody. And so I come to you tonight with a heart of thanks I thank this great university. I thank you, Mr. Chancellor. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. I thank the selection committee. I also honor and congratulate my fellow honorees. I am so blessed to be in such great company, to be in this distinguished company of recipients of the Silas Hunt Legacy Award. And I also come tonight to say thank you to two people that have come with me tonight. My lovely wife, Deborah. <laughs> the first lady of Ohio University. And my oldest son, Ryan, who traveled from New Jersey to be with me tonight. I know that Chancellor Gerhard and President Bobbitt would agree with me that those who suffer the most with our ambitions are our families. And so I want to publicly thank my wife, Deborah, and my son, Ryan, for putting up with my ambitions. But I also want to close tonight by, again, saying thank you to those that are here this evening. Arkansas is a special place. And whatever I do, wherever I go, whatever becomes of me, I will always hold close to my heart this state, this university, Arkansans. Know that you are a special people. Know that this state reached out to a family with open arms, welcomed us, made us feel that we were born in this state. That is not easy to do. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I wish you much continued success 
in the years of head in the years ahead and i want you to know that this award means so much to me but i hope it means so much to the young people who will follow not only in my footsteps but to those whose shoulders we stand on tonight. I thank them for giving me this great opportunity. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the screens as we introduce this evening's third Silas Hunt Legacy Award recipient. I was born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, March 27, 1924. I entered the university the law school in 1949. Of course, when we first went to university, we, uh, though we were admitted, we weren't welcome with open arms. And we didn't move into the dormitories and <laughs> have access to the dining hall. We stayed over in the black community. It was demeaning uh, to be uh, separated in, in that fashion. We didn't have any overt opposition where Folk were coming up, spitting in our face, and and hitting us, and this sort of thing. But it's 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 it's, it's just as uh, hurtful for somebody to look at you, wouldn't even speak to you when, you when you go by, just go by. So it was a bittersweet experience. It was it was an experience where we felt like we we needed uh, to make inroads. But on the other hand, it was almost you were almost isolated when you were in in a community like that. Uh, we didn't have any contemporaries. You know, there, there was no nobody uh, here like this, and so this this was a trying experience to come into to come into Fayetteville. Back back in those days, it was almost hopeless. Uh, in thinking of segregation and, and discrimination. And I thought going to law school would, would uh, give me some leverage, equip me in a way to to uh, attack the problem. Uh, it, the, the, the old common phrase was for the cause, <laughs> to cause to make things better. And so that was uh, part of the, the incentive that made me want to go to law school. Things were it's, as I say, completely segregated. Everything was segregated. It, it looked like you were looking into a, a thousand midnights and trying to see a, a beyond the horizon. It was a, it was very, very dehumanizing. I'm very proud of the fact that I was able to matriculate at the University of Arkansas. I'm very proud of the of the efforts the university that, that Arkansas made to. Uh, uh, expose all of its citizens uh, to the finer things of life. Arkansas has reason to be very proud. It equipped me with information and knowledge that uh, uh, surprised me for life. And you can't you can't take that away from me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you you can't take that away from me. But it's important for the university to, uh, to champion and. And, and try to improve on diversity, just like it's important for America to do that. When, when the, the university named, named the admission building after Silas Hunt, I thought that was a great thing. Of course, 
it, it does a person pride about, uh, they're proud of looking back from whence we came in such a limited position. And of course, I think it's only befitting that Silas would subject himself uh, uh, to that, to go there and and open open the door. And this this shows the foresight that the university had in the, in the beginning, because in 1948, <laughs> there was not another university in the South anywhere that was admitting blacks. This was six years before the Supreme Court decision on desegregation. But in, in talking about Silas, he's someone that that that, that Arkansas can be, be proud of, I guess America, because he served his country, could be proud of, and the university uh, justifiably honors as being a, a true pioneer uh, to put yourself into harm's, harm's way. The changes have come about uh, by evolution, which takes a long time, rather than by revolution. So the, a number of things have evolved uh, down through the years that I've had in, involvement in, and of course, I would not have had the ability to have involvement in if I did not have uh, the academic credentials that I had. Uh, and I think it's befitting that the university would name some sort of honor, even though they, I don't know that they've got it rounded out what it's going to ultimately be. <laughs> I'm sure this would be a part of it, uh, but uh, they, they pick out certain individuals and to think that I, I have been ex exposed myself to, to things that are sufficient to recognize for them to give me consideration as one of the recipients of it, it uh, makes me feel very humble. Chris Mercer is my personal and professional hero. As a person and in his place, as one of the six men who integrated the University of Arkansas School of Law, Chris's faith, perseverance, strength, grace, and good humor make him a hero, not just for me, but for all of us who had followed his entrance into the School of Law. Justice Brandeis noted that what the lawyer needs to redeem himself is not more ability or physical courage, but the moral courage in the face of financial loss and personal ill will to stand for right and justice. Chris Mercer's career is an embodiment of these words. In speaking of Chris's life in the law, Judge Marion Humphrey said, Mr. Mercer has distinguished himself by attending to the legal needs of many persons who would not otherwise have been able to attain legal representation. He has worked as a community servant and leader. And you better know, he continues to make a contribution. Attorney Mercer still practices today. <laughs> 58 years after he passed the bar with the highest score in his group. He sets a very high standard for us all, don't you agree? Now, I don't want to diminish Chris's impressive professional and societal accomplishments, but I feel he's done something equally, if not more important. He has helped move the dialogue of our state and our university past questions of integration and into a discussion of inclusion. I agree with Judge Humphrey that honoring him also honors the great strides the university has made in advancing us towards an academy where all are greeted equally and treated fairly. Now, on a more personal note, 
Introducing Chris this evening is an extraordinary honor for me. He and his wife, Pam, and their family came to my home the evening of the reception celebrating my deanship. He, they, offered prayer, advice, and encouragement, and supported me throughout my tenure. Though imperfectly, I strove to live up to his standard and to honor the legacy that he and the six pioneers established. Chris Mercer has achieved extraordinary distinction in his career in law and public service. His courage, leadership, and contributions to this university and to the law demonstrate an exceptional commitment and dedication to the ideals and purposes of this university. I cannot imagine a more deserving recipient of the Silas Hunt Award. The reputation and efficacy of the University of Arkansas are immeasurably strengthened by Attorney Mercer and all he means to the people we serve. It has been said that a hero is somebody who is selfless, who is generous in spirit, who tries to give back as much as possible and help people. A hero to me is someone who saves people and who really deeply cares. Ladies and gentlemen, my hero, Silas Award honoree, Christopher Columbus Mercer. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, President Bobbitt, faculty, staff, and students, we present the Silas Hunt Legacy Award to Dr. Christopher C. Mercer in recognition of the distinction you have brought to the University of Arkansas and your significant impact on the state of Arkansas, the nation, and the world. Congratulations. Good evening. Good evening. I first beg your indulgence to my growling voice. You heard it a while ago. I used to sound a lot different, <laughs> but uh, I have got paralysis of the vocal cords, and so it makes me sound a little old. First of all, I want to thank Dean Nance for those kind and flattering remarks. And I want to thank Chancellor Gerhard for the presentation of the Silas Hunt Award. I recently became the victim of this paralysis, and so I'm, I'm going to live with it and do what I can. Protocol dictates that all important persons associated with this affair should be acknowledged and saluted. But as you can see, the honorees and other persons are directed to make their acceptance remarks brief as possible. So I'm kind of like the little newspaper reporter who wrote exceptionally long articles because he didn't want to leave out anything important. Well, the newspaper transferred him to the obituary. <laughs> His first obituary column went something like this. The engine of John Jones' car stopped. He lit a match to see if he had any gas. He did. 
he was 65. I don't know whether I can identify all the important things that I need to say with this kind of brevity, but I will try. <laughs> to all the dignitaries and invited guests and all my friends, and especially my wife, Pamela, and my daughter, Crystal, and my son, Justin, salute. <laughs> it is fitting that the Silas Hunt Legacy Award be presented at a banquet because the breaking of bread together is the highest form of fellowship. The legacy started in 1948. One tiny little acorn, Silas Hunt, enrolled in the law school on Monday, February the 2nd, 1948. That was Groundhog Day. <laughs> and history records that he saw his shadow. And according to the sitting Arkansas governor, Ben Laney, hell froze over. <laughs> because it is reputed that he said before a Negro would go to the University of Arkansas, hell would freeze over. <laughs> well, the groundhog saw his shadow that day, and it took 40 years before the first significant official acknowledgement of the 1948 event. However, don't you sinners take solace because I haven't heard that hell froze over. So, so, so you might be going down. Don't be up trying to go down there because the fiery furnace is still burning. In 1988, Balser, and that's the acronym for the Black Law Students Association, sponsored the first Silas Hunt Legacy Program. At that time, the idea of the six pioneers was first born, that's the six, first six black students that enrolled in the university. Of those six, only George Haley and myself are living. The first was Silas Hunt in February of 1948, Jackie Shropshire in September of 1948, George Haley and myself in September of 1949 with only two living, Wiley Brandon in February of 50, and the late George George Howard in September of 50. Mighty oaks from Little Lakers grow. That simply means that great things may come from small beginnings. It's been 60 some years since the first enrollee, and it's my understanding that we've had more than 40,000 black students to attend the university. <laughs> what I would like to do for those of us who are my ethnic hue that went to the university had some involvement with the university, if you'll just stand where you are for 10 seconds. There's all the black students who are here tonight who have some involvement with the university. So I cannot see out there, I think you can see that the multitude goes on. The legacy is now a mighty oak and I hope that it will stand majestic forever out of the accomplishments of the University of Arkansas in the state of, in the state of Arkansas. And I hope it has longevity longer than a thousand fold as, of how long Methuselah lived. <laughs> I'm deeply honored by virtue of the award that you're giving me, and I only make one humble suggestion to the committee that in the spirit of diversity, which you say you are promoting, that we ought to expand the recipients to other ethnic groups. In the beginning, it said that there had been 18 recipients. Technically, it had been 20 recipients to receive theirs by themselves. Now, my years on the campus was made a lot better by virtue of me having some white friends. That's the reason I make the suggestion that the, the awards ought to be expanded because up to now, 20 of us who've received these awards all have been black. 
and Dr. Robinson, you Vice Chancellor for Diversity, I make that rec humble recommendation to you. I probably have been much too verbose in my appreciation. And so in the spirit of the reporter who wrote the first obituary, I leave you with this admonition. Six of the greatest words ever spoken by three of the greatest men to ever live. Socrates said, know thyself. Cicero said, control thyself. Jesus Christ says, give thyself. <laughs> Dr. Robinson, if you would come forward, please. I, Christopher C. Mercer, Jr., make this gift a, a legal farm book owned originally by Silas Hunt in 1948 and then owned by me from 1949 to April 13, 2012. I would like for this to be a memento kept in the archives of the Silas Hunt Executive Committee. It's been used real good, so it's kind of fragile. <laughs> They were kind enough to indulge me in one other thing. My baby daughter, Crystal Mercer, almost named after me, <laughs> is one of the finest poets I I've ever known, and she has a, 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 a poetic gesture that she wants to dedicate to the Silas Hunt Committee Award. Hear her, Crystal Murphy. Thank you, Daddy. Good evening, everybody. It is a great honor to express poetic words for the occasion, and my piece is called On the Hunt for justice. The residents of time, from the micro existence of creation to present manifestations, believe the great kings and queens were descendants of the gods that reigned supreme, giants of humanity, commanding change by the wave of their hands or the whisper of a name, calling on the symmetry of the universe, and on this trail to forge balance and equality within the hearts and minds of all mankind of every creature that lingers in the creases of life, there was passion in their pursuit. On the hunt for justice, the seeds of Silas sprouting serendipitously throughout us and about us, among the population of the world, to nourish our tastes with delectable fruits, bearing seeds, blooming into trees, from Texas to Ohio in the rigid American breeze. The great kings and queens are among us still, gathering their fruit in the northern hills of the natural state, yet unnatural causes await, and their centers for knowledge, on their courts of athletic display. There were times these trees had to bend in order to mend the brokenness of man, harvesting hatred, victims of resentment. And yet, they yielded love and attempted to bear fruit absent of the youth hanging from the popular trees. In their experience of the rigid American breeze, their limbs linked with the audacity of hope, and hope was born. For the sun, not hate, was the center of the universe, and their light spread all over the world. We honor the fruit of royalty. On the hunt for justice, they scattered their seeds about the earth, planting peace, passion, tenacity, planting decency, an element essential for humanity. And for the seed that planted me, I, a mercer, fruit from his tree, a giant lending his hands to balance the scales of justice for years on end, blooming into this season of action. My duty, my divinity by birth, is to place my hands atop my father's hands on the many hands that weigh righteousness on an equal plane, 
to be a keeper of the scales, and to always work for positive change on my hunt for justice, so that we, as a global community, may continue to plant the seeds of future kings and queens. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the screens as we introduce to you our final Silas Hunt Legacy Award recipient. I was born in El Paso, Texas and uh, grew up there. Uh, went to junior high and elementary school. Uh, back in the days when I was growing up, of course, the, the city was segregated, and so we went to a black uh, elementary and junior high. And in 55, I, I became a freshman in high school, and of course, uh, the rules and the laws had changed. Uh, the integration took place, and I, I went off to Bowie High School. So uh, I had, a, 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 to me, a very healthy type uh, growing up because I, I was involved with both sides of, of the minority races and that being Mexican-American people and, and the black American people. Went to Arizona Junior College. It was a place in Thatcher, Arizona. And after that, I decided to, to move back home to El Paso and enroll at Texas Western College, which is now UTEP. And I was able to leave from Texas and go on to become a coach at the high school that I'd gone to. So I spent 13 years at Bowie High School. Uh, during those days, uh, you know, I, there were no black coaches uh, to speak of. And the principal was named Frank C. Pollitt, who was my principal, had told me once before that if you finish your degree and come back and start coaching, one day we'll make you a head coach of some sport. And, I always liked football, but I, he, he told me that don't choose that one because he didn't think I'd ever get the opportunity. Being a black coach would never have the opportunity to do that. He was straight up and he was honest. He said, I would concentrate on baseball and basketball if I were you. And so I, I really concentrated on basketball. Uh, my mom died when I was three years of age and, and my grandmother picked us up from California. We were out there in Los Angeles and brought us to El Paso. My dad died at, when I was 12, and so my grandfather, who was with, at the time, my grandmother when I was three, he also passed away when I was 10. So we had this one little old lady who had 11 kids, and she was the one that kind of made us understand that you have to do things in order for things to change, and she would always say that. People don't realize that in the time that I was growing up, my grandmother's mother was a slave. My great-grandmother wasn't that far removed from her telling me how things was. And that, that was brutal to hear the things that she would be telling me that happened to her mother and dad. So, you know, I had, I had a lot of background growing up of what I was supposed to be like. So I took on my own from my grandmother's talkings that this is more about, not about you, what you're doing. It's what you can do for others. Because you gotta remember, black folks are placed in a group and what you do hurts the group. Caucasian are judged individually. If this guy gets in trouble, they judge that guy. If you get in trouble, they judge your whole group. That's the difference, and you got to understand that. So it's bigger than you. 
I'm, I've been very blessed and very fortunate to win all kinds of awards, from Hall of Fame awards, school named after me, highways, recreation centers. But to, to put the deal on, on a Silas Hunt, that's more humanized to me about human people not giving up to someone say that you can't do it. You shouldn't be here. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a coach, a player. You can't tell me what I can't do. You can't win. You can't win here. You, you can't coach here. Uh, you can't go to school here. That's when I want to, that's when I really want to do more when you tell me that I can't. And I, that's how I saw the Silas Hunt person. You can't tell me what I can't do. Had he not fought the system, if he had not fought to get in, or if he had not done these things, where, where would we be? Sometimes you wonder about, where would you be if someone didn't fight for what was right? And for him to, to have tried to get into schools and kept, kept af after it, and then finally get in, and then for him to be in a classroom in the, in the basement, to me, that's, that's the same thing uh, that you think of when you think of in terms of Dr. King. He's not here with us, but he, he helped us get to where we need to go. This young man back in 1948 did something that I'm glad that they're recognizing that he did something that was very special very special, and especially the people of color, and especially the people of my generation. The journey is not over, probably will never be over, uh, but at least the journey of, of what the university is trying to do is important to continue this work, to continue to, 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 to bring people together, to continue to make it one race of people, and that's the human race. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor to introduce the next recipient of the Silas Hunt Legacy Award. To me, he will always be coach, my coach. He was the only coach to win a junior college national championship, the NIT, and the NCAA tournament. For 17 years, he was the heart and soul of the men's basketball program at the University of Arkansas. In addition to being the first African-American head coach, he is the winningest coach in Arkansas history. with almost 400 wins. It was a privilege and an honor for me to take part in some of those victories. He took the Razorbacks to three Final Fours, <laughs> beating Duke for the championship in 1994 with a fast, physical style of play that we call 40 Minutes of Hell. In 1994, our team won 31 games with an average margin of victory of almost 18 points. People looked at our team, marveled at our talent and our ability. To me, what they always underestimated was how hard he pushed us to accomplish our goals. We thought that getting up at 6 a.m. for practice was punishment, but it was actually preparation for games and for life. While the opponents were still asleep, Coach was teaching us about the value of hard work, accountability, and responsibility. He demanded a lot from us. And he taught us to demand a lot from ourselves. He taught us not to make excuse, excuses for, for why we could not do something. Coach is a vital part of this great university and its winning tradition. He brought recognition and distinction to Razorback basketball and respect to our athletic program and the student athletes. From his early days of coaching in El Paso, 
all the way to his tenure in the WNBA. He's been a role model, a leader, and an inspiration for student athletes. He was extremely instrumental in making our student athletes winners both on and off the court. I'm extremely proud that we can recognize his accomplishments and all he has done on behalf of the University of Arkansas. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Silas Hunt Legacy Award winner, my coach, Nolan Richardson. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, President Bobbitt, faculty, staff, and students, we present the Silas Hunt Legacy Award to Coach Nolan Richardson, Jr. in recognition of the distinction you have brought to the University of Arkansas and your significant impact on the state of Arkansas, the nation, and the world. Congratulations, Coach. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. I am, uh, first of all, very honored to be a recipient, especially among the people that I just saw get up here and, and talk. CC, you are incredible. Uh, absolutely incredible. Those are not enough adjectives for you. The thing that was very important is the fact that Scotty Thurman introduced me I wrote his speech. <laughs> and I was making sure he said every word that I wrote down. <laughs> you know, you saw the introduction of who I am and what, what I stand for. I want to say this before I get into it, thanking the, the committee for giving me this award. I want to say that it's been trying time for the University of Arkansas this past week. I'd like to have my hats off to, to the athletic director, Jeff Long. Let's give him another round of applause. My hat's off to him. I want to thank Dr. Gerhardt. I want to thank uh, Charles Robinson. And of course, I want to thank the committee. You know, when I think of Silas Hunt, you know, I, I feel funny inside because I can imagine what he went through sitting in a classroom trying to get an education from a law school. Can you imagine sitting there maybe by yourself and you're, have a professor teaching you some law, you're alone? Then I say to myself, you got people like C.C. Mercer, who's still practicing law. It's incredible. These are the people that as a young man, that's all I wanted to be like. That was important to me. The important thing, as old granny would say, is that you must pave the road for those who's going to follow. And that's what happened. CC, you paved some roads. Silas Hunt, absolutely. You paved roads. You know, as I thought about the things that have happened to me in my life and going through Racism, segregation, you know, I remember I being the only black kid at a Mexican-American school. Only one. But when they mentioned that word about having more Mexican kids at the school, I taught them for 13 years. And they can pass too. You know? So I'm diverse. That's what's important. Diversifying, I am, my hat's off to, to Dr. Robinson. The university, I'm happy 
even though he was in a classroom alone, they opened the door. They cracked it and he bust in. They didn't want him in there, but he went on and bust in. That I like. And that's what it's all about. This is the last part, what I was thinking. I'll never forget these words. I would think that Hunt, Silas Hunt, had three things that he had to do. There's three things you have to pay attention to. The one who is indifference to you must pay attention to that person that's indifferent to you. The one who hates you must pay attention to that person. And the one who loves you are the important three. The one who is indifferent to you is your friend. Love him. Isn't that amazing? She said, if he's indifferent to you, you must love him because he teaches you self-reliance. Te that teaches you self-reliance. The one who hates you is your friend. Love him. You know why you have to love him? Because he teaches you caution. And the final one, the one who loves you. Love him because he teaches you tenderness. I think of Silas having those three qualities. And that's amazing qualities. As I said before, if I should leave this earth at any point because we're not promised, I'm not worried about what my legacy might be. A lot of folks want, well, what's your legacy? I don't, I wish I could care less about a legacy, but I do care about one thing. I know that if I reach the kingdom of heaven, he's not going to ask me how many games I want. Now, he just might ask me one thing. He just might ask me, how many lives did you touch? That's important. Silas Hunt touched lives. Thank you. Returning to the stage for this evening's closing musical performance is the West Memphis High School Vocal Arts Premier Performance Group, Southern Exposure. Southern Exposure has won first place concert and show choir in festivals in New Orleans, Dallas, St. Louis, Gatlinburg, and Nashville. The group placed second in concert choir and show choir in New York City's Heritage Festival in 2008 and 2011. Southern Exposure has performed at Carnegie Hall and been a special guest at the White House. West Memphis High School Vocal Arts is under the direction of Doug Conwell and assistant Brandy Allison. Since its establishment, the choir has continued to grow in both breadth and depth. It is now composed of primarily sophomores, juniors, and seniors, and is by audition only. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Southern Exposure. Good evening. On behalf of Superintendent Bill Kessinger, our principal John Collins, we very much appreciate the University of Arkansas and the Department of Diversity inviting us. We just completed a concert 
with our own famous Broadway star, Arkansan Lawrence Hamilton. We're singing three numbers from that show. The first is Say a Prayer from the Broadway musical Memphis. Our soloist is Robert Jones. Say a prayer that changes the coming. Say a prayer that hope is around the bend. And if you pray that changes are coming, oh Jesus, may what you pray come true. Amen. Say a prayer. The changes are coming. Say a prayer. That hope is around the Broadway musical Pearly, Walk Him Up the Stairs. Our soloist is LaShondra Berry. Walk him up, walk him up, walk him up the stairs, walk him up. Right up to those pearly gates, float him on up to those gates. 
We're closing tonight with Cole Porter's famous tune from Anything Goes, Blow, Gabriel, Blow. Again, thank you for having us. thank once again West Memphis Choir and also the Lee Choir for the excellent performances they've given us tonight. We also want to thank each and every one of you for coming out and celebrating with us tonight, recognizing these wonderful honorees that we've had. Well, the night has been a good one. Uh, the band will continue playing though, so don't feel that you have to run. Uh, you can enjoy the music for as long as you like. Thank you once again. I've been asked to have the recipients come up front so that they, some more uh, photos, can, photos can be taken. And I want to just recognize our special events staff re really quickly. They've done such a wonderful job. Let's give them a hand. Well, thank you. Have a wonderful evening and good night.